we do help. SMS MedShield to 33023 or talk to your broker to get your kind of care. I was, I was sick and uh, I used the antibiotics. I think they're good. So how did you feel after checking the antibiotics? Uh, I, felt, I felt okay. Eh? I felt good. It usually takes weeks you know, to feel better. Yeah. Even if you have a wound, a bad wound, if you take antibiotics, yeah, the show will help you. Uh, yes, I've used uh, antibiotics. Uh, it was quite a while back. I was prescribed by it from my doctor. And then um, I drank them, but the, what, what, the after effects I had is that I was very sleepy and I was very weak because of the amount of, um, I don't know what they put in them, but it's very, it's very heavy on the system. I did try them, but it didn't work for me, man. What happened? You say it didn't work? Uh, it, it did, I did vomit after them, my brother. Is it? Yeah. So after that, you never tried to take antibiotics? Ah, uh, since from that, he cut it off. Um, I have used antibiotics, but they don't actually really work because they say you must finish the course, but you don't see what, what's the difference when not using them and using them. So I just don't go to hospital no more because doctors give me antibiotics and I, they don't work for me. Yes, I did use the, the antibiotics. Um, usually when I'm sick or something, I usually get a prescription from a doctor. So I'll just go and take the, those medicines, those pills actually. So yeah, um, they've never really affected me. Um, I have used what's this antibiotics and it wasn't really an issue like they helped me. You are both. In terms of antibiotics, I have two children and ever since uh, they've been small, whenever they've been sick, Doctors will prescribe antibiotics and it works for them. The condition of antibiotics is when they complete the prescription, then it works. But if they don't complete the prescription, then it don't work. People sharing their experiences and thoughts on antibiotics. And I'm, I'm certain that you may also have something to share about antibiotics. Now, there are instances where people get sick and require antibiotics. But there are also instances where people get sick but do not require antibiotics. Now picture the situation. You get sick and you require antibiotics. You get given antibiotics and you simply don't recover. You get given the best and so-called strongest ones available in the market, but still don't recover. With the real chance that you may ultimately succumb to your illness. Now that's when you said you have resistance against antibiotics and are infected by the so-called superbugs. Now currently 700,000 people die each year from resistant infections. Now that number is set to rise to 10 million by 2050 if no action is taken. Now how exactly does that happen and what action can be taken to prevent it? Well stay tuned because this is what we're tackling in our show today. Our guest panel is comprised of experts from the National Department of Health, National Institute for Communicable Diseases, a, a, a University Pharmacy Department and the Netcare Hospital Group. Now I invite you to sit back, relax and learn from this show ahead. Call us with your questions or views on John's back 714. 6841-6842-6843. Send us a tweet at SABC Health Talk or simply interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. I'm Dr. Salom Daung and this is Health Talk. Antibiotics are medicines used to prevent and treat infections caused by bacteria. South Africa has a high burden of infectious diseases and antibiotics have been widely used to combat these. The World Health Organization has declared the 14th to the 20th of November 2016 as Antibiotic Awareness Week. The aim of this week is really to raise awareness about the importance of responsible use of antibiotics and, to, and, and the role of that to then decrease the risk of antibiotic resistance. So the theme that the WHO has set forth for this week is handle with care and pharmadynamics is driving this, this education campaign amongst healthcare professionals as well as the public. And the logo we have developed this week around the, around the tagline of handle with care, you can see it on my t-shirt. And really what we're trying to drive this week amongst healthcare workers and the public is good hand hygiene. So taking awareness of how easily we can spread bacteria from one surface to 
to the next with our hands and also what the correct hand washing techniques are. Vaccines can help limit the spread of antibiotic resistance. So it is important to inquire about vaccines recommended for you and your family to avoid infections that may require an antibiotic. Vaccinations protect against a lot of diseases that would otherwise be treated with antibiotics. So to give an example on this, if we look at the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, which forms part of South Africa's expanded program on immunization, this vaccine, if it was rolled out globally, it could prevent as much as 11.4 million days of antibiotic treatment in children under the age of five years every single year because it protects against pneumonia. If antibiotics are overused or used incorrectly, there is a risk that the bacteria will become resistant. Then the antibiotic becomes less effective against the type of bacterium. The more that you expose a bacteria to an antibiotic, the more it then starts to develop resistance. And so overexposure to antibiotics, of course, speeds this up. So incorrect use or irresponsible use of antibiotics makes this resistance develop faster. And an example is giving an antibiotic for the wrong reason. So if you, for example, have a viral infection, it's inappropriate to treat that with an antibiotic. But if you have a bacterial infection, then an antibiotic is the answer. When you have been prescribed antibiotics, it is crucial to complete the prescribed course even though you may feel better before your medicine is entirely finished. Right, now to learn more about antibiotics, it's a great pleasure to welcome into our studio. First up, Professor Natalie Shellack. Prof. Shellack is the course coordinator um, of clinical pharmacy at the Department of Pharmacy at the uh, Sifako Makato Health Sciences University. Welcome to Health Talk, Prof. Thank you very much. All right, and next to Prof. Shellack is Dr. Karen Reddy. Now, Dr. Karen Reddy is um, from the Center for Enteric Diseases, the co-head of the Center for Enteric Diseases at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Kelly. Thank you. Good morning. All right. Perhaps let's start with you, um, uh, Prof. We're talking antibiotics. What are antibiotics? Okay, so antibiotics is a term that we use to describe a group of medicines that actually acts against microorganisms. Mm. So if we look at this in the strictest sense of the word, when we talk about antibiotics, we talk about medicines that may have been synthesized by other bacteria or microorganisms yeah. that act against bacteria. Mm. But what I would just like to say today is that in South Africa, we, our challenge and our responsibility is a little bit um, more mm. because we also have resistance against HIV. Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that. But, yes. but, but let's just first understand what these antibiotics are and what, what they do. Are there okay. perhaps different types of them? Yes. Are there? Yeah. So you get different types of antibiotics and we describe them according to classes. Right. So you could describe them according to how they work. Right. So do they work on the bacterial cell wall? Yeah. Do they work within the bacteria? Or we also describe them in groups of what bacteria they act against. Right. And that's how we classify them. Okay. Now, Dr. Kelly, let, let me bring you in here. I mean, you often hear people talk of, I need a strong antibiotic. Is there anything such as a strong antibiotic and a weak antibiotic? There are definitely antibiotics that may be more effective against a broader spectrum of organisms. Yeah. And counter to that, there are obviously those antibiotics that have a very narrow spectrum. However, converse to popular understanding, often those with a narrower spectrum may actually treat certain organisms better than the very broad spectrum, which can yeah. be a little bit nonspecific. Right. And therefore, if you've got good diagnostics and you know exactly what you're treating, mm. you do enhance your opportunities to actually prescribe a narrow spectrum antibiotic that will treat that specific disease compared with if you don't know what the organism is that you're trying to treat and then your prescribing may be very very broad and your mm -hmm. management may therefore be a little bit non-specific all right so so essentially i mean that that talks to the professional that is prescribing and i guess from a a consumer or a patient perspective is you get given the antibiotic that is most suitable to the infection that is being treated correct from a patient perspective, I think that is what you are hoping for. Mm. I think probably what we r really need is an informed patient. Right. And you are allowed to ask your doctor 
what are you prescribing for me and why are you, why are you prescribing this one? Okay. And I think if the patient is informed and actually understands what the indication is, mm -hmm. it'll improve both the way they take antibiotics right. and also possibly help GPs think a little bit more carefully about what they're prescribing and when they're prescribing. Okay. Talk about indications. Perhaps let's, start, let's go back to you, Prof. What are antibiotics indicated for? What are those common conditions that we perhaps know about that you know, require antibiotics as treatment? Okay, so um, indications can include uh, um, diseases which we might have to cure, where we know that there's a microorganism that's causing this condition. So, for example, if you've got a very bad skin infection and we know that there are microorganisms growing in there, then we will first treat the surgical site and then if it spreads, we will treat you systemically. Mm -hmm. But we could also use antibiotics for prevention. So often if patients are going for a specific surgery, then we would use antibiotics to prevent an infection if we know that there's a high likelihood mm -hmm. that um, infection may occur. Okay. That's a bit of a controversial one. We'll, we'll get back yes. to that of, yes, you know, so-called prophylaxis, isn't that so? Yes. Now, um, let, let's come back to you, Dr. K. Any other, perhaps, you know, examples that you may think about, uh, you know, where antibiotics are indicated? She mentioned sometimes very bad skin infections. I think there are some indications where antibiotics are absolutely mandatory. Mm. Antibiotics would be mandatory, for instance, in those patients who already have systemic infections. Mm. I come from a background of enteric diseases, so therefore the first one that springs to my mind is typhoid fever. Right. Typhoid fever must be managed with antibiotics. That's incontroversial. Right. Um, any bacteremic infection, whether it's a bloodstream infection, you'd want to manage with an antibiotics. Mm. Any deep-seated infections, um, so if you have deep-seated abscesses, etc., you might need an antibiotic, or you should have an antibiotic. Meningitis, it is incontroversial. If you've got a bacterial meningitis, it must be managed with antibiotics. Okay. In these instances, however, your, your physician is going to be very, very involved in your management. Yeah. And I think those, those opportunities for the organisms to grow resistant may still occur, but they're less likely to occur because your physician will be very careful about ensuring that treatment in these cases is actually completed. Where problems arise is where the patient goes to see somebody, they may have a sore throat, they may even have a bacterial infection associated with that, for instance sinusitis. They get given antibiotics to take at home and they tend to stop these antibiotics when they're feeling better. Yeah, we're actually going to come back course. to that and talk about sore throat. Are there instances where antibiotics are not indicated? Anyone? So yes, certainly. Um, so for example, when we go into winter, so there are certain seasonal viruses that we know. We've got the common flu. So if there's a viral um, infection, then antibiotics are not indicated for parasitic infections, for fungal infections. So yes, there are conditions where we don't need antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And most likely, if we know that it's flu season, then we would like to advise consumers to not exert a lot of pressure on their physicians. Mm -hmm. I've heard some of your, um, you know, in the preempt to your show, there were some of the people on the street. And I enjoyed that because they said they go to the doctor and they get a prescription. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that people realize that you don't always need an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. And some of the doctors will tell them, well, now it's flu season, so we're not going to give you an antibiotic. Mm -hmm. But then some patients become very angry. Yeah. All right. Um, fascinating discussion. And, and of course, uh, we're not going to have time to talk about, you know, side effects and dangers. Antibiotics can, by themselves, have dangerous side effects. Correct, Dr. Kerry? One that, second. That, that, that is correct. I think one of the ones that we're very, very concerned about in, is probably more common than others is things such as allergy to antibiotics. So right. not everybody can take all antibiotics. A right. very common allergy, for instance, is to the sulfur class or to the penicillins. All right. And the other side effects that we worry about with certain antibiotics is certain antibiotics can actually cause blindness or deafness. So although they are very powerful, yeah. they, they really they need to be, be used in dangerous. extreme conditions. They need to be handled with care. And they're okay. Let's break quickly. And when we come back, we now talk about prescriptions and, you know, antibiotics being prescribed. Are they prescribed appropriately? That after the break, please stay with us.
MedShield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. It's so good, nothing else can replace Just your slightest embrace And if you only would Be my own For the rest of my day I will whisper this phrase My darling Ceci Pong MedShield, embracing our members in good health since 1968. Welcome back. Now, we're talking antibiotics. Now, irrational prescriptions are a major health problem. In other words, irrational prescription of antibiotics are a major problem and are put, putting patients at risk. Now, let's learn more about this from our guests. We still have Prof. Natalie Shellack um, from the Clinical Pharmacy Department of uh, Sefako Makato Health Sciences University. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome another special guest, Angeliki Messina. Angelique is the NetCare Antibiotic Stewardship Project Manager. Now, we're going to learn more about what stewardship is, but for now, we're talking prescribing antibiotics. Let's start with you, Prof. Who can prescribe antibiotics? Okay, so in South Africa, we've got schedules. The different med medicines are classified in schedules, and antibiotics is what we call a schedule four. So for, for the consumer, that just means that it has to be prescribed by a medical practitioner, or um, in, we've got authorized nursing prescribers in uh, clinic settings from the National Department of Health where there's authorized clinics where they can prescribe according to a standard treatment guideline. Mm -hmm. Okay, Angeliki, you, you, by the way, I mean, I introduced you as the um, stewardship uh, project manager in NetCare, but you're also a pharmacist by yes. profession, correct? Yes. Okay, now, in your opinion, are antibiotics prescribed appropriately? <laughs> So I think the word appropriate is a very controversial statement when it comes to antibiotics because right. it's really difficult to know which antibiotic is appropriate if you don't know what the infection is that mm. you're wanting to treat. Right. So um, I think for community acquired infections, um, establishing the appropriate antibiotic is m much more difficult if you haven't perhaps cultured an organism. Right. So you may treat more broad spectrum um, with more broad spectrum therapy, but and it is appropriate, but may not be appropriate for the specific organism that you're treating. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of hospital prescribing, um, they're more likely in hospital to do a culture if they are suspecting a patient is, um, has an infection. Yeah. Um, and once you know what you're treating, you can then tailor the therapy accordingly to ensure that it is an appropriate antibiotic. So, so one could argue, therefore, that in a hospital setting, the level of inappropriate prescription should be a little less because there's an opportunity <laughs> to make sure that, you know, uh, there's a direct link between the infection and the antibiotic prescribed, isn't that so? Well, I think in, in the hospital setting, um, it, it's uh, easier or, um, to get diagnostics, mm -hmm. whereas in the community, if you're a patient going to see your general practitioner, um, they may um, not be doing, unless it's a urinary tract infection that they will then take a urine sample um, before giving you an antibiotic, but if it's an upper respiratory tract infection, um, they, they un they're less likely to take cultures prior to prescribing. All right. We obviously spent a lot of time on the prescriber. Okay, we said that obviously, you know, there are regulations that, uh, uh, you know, regulate. Uh, why, by the way, should there be these different schedules? Okay, so these schedules are actually, um, it's to protect the medicines first, but it's also to protect the consumer. So some of the, an example that I could use is for example, the opioids. Mm. So that's to prevent addiction. But then for antibiotics, I think we often talk about restrictive, 
but um, I've also learned another word perhaps from um, a colleague of ours in the United States and she talks about protective and I think that's a nice word to say that we are protecting antibiotics for our future generation Correct. so and I think we should look at all medicines like that and we're also protecting the patients isn't we are protecting because they can be yes. dangerous isn't that so? and can I just say as well so then often I think the patients think that this doctor now don't want to give me this medicine but he's actually protecting you and he's protecting your future generation yeah. because if you don't take your antihypertensives correctly yeah. then you will have a stroke and that's you you know I love you and I'm sorry for you but that's what's happened right. but if you don't take your antibiotics correctly you're influencing all of our children we're, com we're gonna come back to taking them correctly just now but let's take yes. Jack on the line Jack welcome to Health Talk good morning and thank you for having me on uh, the show mm. Jack, Jack can, I, can I ask you a big favor? Can you please just switch off your television set? Uh, because it's, it's just giving us this uh, terrible... Okay, is that yeah. better now? That's better, yeah. Your, your quick okay, question, the first yeah? question, then, I've got two questions. The first question is uh, how uh, the antibiotic that I'm taking at the moment is interacting with a tablet that I'm taking called um, Aeropex. Aropex. So the drug interaction. Yeah. And the second question to the panel is, what is the common um, side effect from antibiotics that I'm consuming right now? What I'm experiencing is like like very weak, fatigue, tired, etc. Okay. All right. Th thank Can you I very much, Jack. Can I off now? Yeah. Thank you very much. We'll, we'll try thank and address you. your questions. We may not be specific but we will talk i mean we will pick from his questions is he's raising very two important issues that of drug interactions and the side effects we've mm. touched on side effects a little bit mm. but perhaps perhaps let's let's go to you angelique um what's your take on drug interactions i mean um, what should people be doing when they know that they're taking other drugs and they're receiving antibiotics yeah so um, I think uh, there's a misconception that antibiotics are safe medicines um, and uh, d just by taking a medication in itself, out, when we swallow a tablet for instance, it gets metabolized and broken down and most of the metabolism happens in the liver mm. and uh, that is the same for many of the other medications that you may be taking and, and that's when the interactions start occurring. Um, and so. Definitely, by taking an antibiotic, it, it will interact with any of your other medications, but we also have different grading of interaction. So sure. some may be more severe yeah. um, and some may be less severe. Okay. Yeah, but, but, but the bottom line is that uh, I suppose if, if you're a patient and you're receiving antibiotics, it's best to declare to the person that's prescribing the antibiotic uh, um, too that in fact, you know, you, you, you're taking other Are drugs they? and uh, they may be able to to tell you what the possible interactions exactly. is. Exactly. All right, let's take Tulani uh, from Cape Town. Tulani, welcome to Health Talk. Good morning, and thank you very much. Yeah, your quick question or comment, please. My question is that how does the doctor know that the antibiotics that they are prescri prescribing for me are suitable for my disease? Ah, mm -hmm. excellent question. That, uh, yep. I once had flu, yeah. and then I was uh, prescribed for a certain antibiotic, uh -huh. And my friend also had a problem with his teeth, and then the same antibiotics were prescribed for him as well. Tulani, thank you very much. You're bringing very important questions. Mm -hmm. Firstly, how does the doctor know that this antibiotic that is being prescribed is suitable for the infection that he's taking? And he's also bringing another mm -hmm. issue around, obviously, taking an antibiotic for flu mm -hmm. and also seeing what his friend who was treated <laughs> for a tooth infection, yes. got. Now, yes. all of these are very important wow. issues. Now. So first of all, I want to say to Lon, you're an absolute genius because that's a fantastic question. Mm. But secondly, I would like to say when it comes to knowing what antibiotics we have to prescribe, there are two things that we have to look at. And first of all, I think it's important to realize some of the diagnostic tools that we are using is very old. It's sometimes difficult for physicians to, un to know exactly at that moment when the patient presents to them what condition they have.
and because we're working with some outdated diagnostic tools and that's why the clinician's diagnostic skills can never be underestimated. Mm -hmm. So if you go to a general practitioner and within five minutes he says without even examining you, without asking you questions and he just gives you an antibiotic, that should already tell you something. Um, it, I might not say on this show what it should tell you, but I'm sure you can, you know, you can deduce from that. All right, okay. We, we, yes. we unfortunately are going to be running out of time, but just two brief comments, if I can just, you know, uh, do that quickly. That we're going to come back to the issue of antibiotics and flu, because yes. flu does not require antibiotics. And yes. number two, you do not get advice on antibiotics from your friend. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, okay. I believe that there's about two, four or five tweets that have just come through. Alina says, uh, interesting topic for me since I have been taking antibiotics for my wisdom tooth pain. <laughs> okay, and Ruth says, why we can't buy antibiotics over the counter? Because pharmacies are trained and there's some doctors behind. Monique says, finally finished my course on antibiotics. Yay! Okay, good on you, well Monique. <laughs> Shandu says, the doctor prescribed them for my kids for flu and they work once they complete the course, but they have running stomach after. Mm. Uh -huh. mm. Very interesting one. Liesl says, um, yes, I did use it before and so are my kids. After that, we feel good and full of energy. Yes, sure. okay. That may relate to perhaps... <laughs> um, energy uh, resting yeah, in some All right, okay. At, at this stage, um, I'm afraid we've run out of time. And let me say thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Prof. Shellac for your contribution and we're going to stay with you for a while and go for a quick break and when we come back we'll now talk about that rising threat of antibiotic resistance. Please stay with us. If we are talking health, then let's talk seriously. Macro is going big on festive season savings with high-tech deals like the new PS4 1TB Slim Console with Call of Duty and God of War 3 only 5999 saves 700 Rand. A Samsung 55-inch Smart Curved UHD LED TV for 14999 save 3000 Rand. And save 100 Rand on the new TomTom Tom Touch Activity Tracker, now only 2399 Share in these and other big festive savings for home, for business, for life. Macro. Big on life. MedShield Medical Scheme doesn't just cover you when you're ill. We'll help you stay well. This British drug company is fighting a potentially deadly threat, one which some say could kill 10 million people a year by 2050 and cost $100 trillion if it's not contained. It's called antimicrobial resistance. What's happening out there in the bacterial communities is the bacteria are becoming more resistant to antibiotics that we have in practice at the moment. And the reason for that is we're using a lot of them and bacteria don't want to be killed, so they're evolving. The world has seen very few new antibiotics over the past few decades. Instead, drug companies have focused on more immediate, profitable diseases like cancer. A review by the British government is pushing to change that. It's urging drug companies to develop new resistant antibiotics and be paid a reward for doing so. The scientific knowledge of the few that know about it is pretty strong. So how come nothing has changed? And the answer is people don't want to get out of the comfort zone. So everybody's got to get out of the comfort zone. Pharmaceutical companies, policy makers, the agricultural industry. O'Neill even suggests there should be fines for those who neglect the problem. Drug companies aren't fond of that idea, saying it would be counterproductive. Welcome back. Now, antimicrobial resistance is one of the biggest threats to global health today. It poses a major challenge to health, food and security and development. And it can affect anyone, any age, Anyway, now let's learn more about this from our guest, Dr. Gavin Steele, 
Great pleasure to welcome Dr. Steele. Dr. Steele is the Chief Director of Sector-Wide Procurement from the National Department of Health. Welcome to Health Talk, Dr. Steele. Thank you. And of course, we still have Dr. Karen Reddy, co-head um, Center for Enteric Diseases, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases. Now, we hear about this antimicrobial resistance. Perhaps let's start with you in simple terms. Uh, Dr. Steele, what is antimicrobial resistance and how does it develop? So if we look at antibiotics, they come from bacteria. Mm. And it was a selective ecology. So it allowed some bacteria to do well in competing with others. Mm. So already by the time we discovered antibiotics, nature had de developed systems to resist the antibiotics so that those certain bacteria that were making the antibiotic would then um, be able to dominate that environment. Right. And so basically what we see when we use an antibiotic is it kills the bacteria and in our body there's good and there's bad bacteria. Mm -hmm. the, the, if the antibiotic is correct and is taken correctly, mm -hmm. the bad bacteria are killed and unfortunately also some of the good bacteria. Mm -hmm. If you miss doses or the dose is incorrect or we have an interaction and the blood levels on, of the antibiotic aren't adequate, yeah. then you're giving an opportunity for this bacteria to learn a way to get around the next dose of antibiotic before it comes. Mm. And that we call resistance. Right. And resistance can be all sorts of things. The, the early one that we saw was whereby the bacteria pumped out an enzyme and that enzyme broke down the antibiotic before it right. had an opportunity to work. Okay, so, so in the context of South Africa then, you know, how, 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 how serious is this in the first instance and, and, and what is government doing about it seeing that you represent the Department of Health? So we see it as a serious threat. Um, Lord O'Neill that you saw in the insert there predicts that antibiotic resistance will impact the GDP of African countries on average between 1 and 3 percent decline. Mm. And so it is of national importance. So what we have done as a South African government is a few things. We've worked in the international sphere. So we worked alongside the United Kingdom in getting the World Health Assembly to adopt a approach towards antimicrobial resistance. And then again in September this year, our president worked with the president of France to get the United Nations to pass a declaration around antimicrobial resistance and the importance of the world to rally around this and it's only the fourth time in the history of the United Nations that such a declaration on health has been passed. Mm -hmm. Nationally what have we done? We have created a strategy against antimicrobial resistance and that has been signed by all sectors of society both in the public and the private, the various professional groupings as well as the various regulatory authorities. Yeah. And the minister has appointed what we call the minister, Ministerial Advisory Committee on Antimicrobial Resistance. Mm -hmm. And when was this appointed? The appointment was this year. This in year. This quarter. Okay. I'll come back to you just now because I'd like to know, you know, what progress has been made so far. But let's, let's get back to you, Dr. Uh, uh, Kedi. We, we've spoken earlier about the, the whole notion of superbugs. Can, yes. can you just explain in simple terms what these superbugs are? Okay, superbugs is basically a term that was coined by the press to describe those organisms that are multidrug resistant, in other words, resistant to all of the antibiotics that we currently have available in our armamentarium. Um, often these organisms are acquired in hospital. Okay, so really what actually has happened in the hospital is some patient has been exposed to antibiotics, they've developed a risk resistant organism and then this organism has actually been passed on to the other patients within the hospital causing an outbreak within the hospital. Um, very very concerning um, there are many organisms that are literally within hospitals becoming resistant to all unknown antibiotics mm. and these infections basically have become untreatable. Mm. All right um, I'm going to ask you about you know how what are the reasons behind this whole resistance? You know, what is actually leading to this kind of resistance? But let's talk, let's take Victor on the line from Limpopo. Victor, welcome to Health Talk. Hello, sir. How are you? Good, how are you? Very, very well, sir. Hmm. 
Uh, currently, um, I think for the past five years or so, I'm suffering from this skin disease. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's in the blood because sometimes it will move from one place in the body to another. Yeah. Uh, now, currently I don't have uh, funds in the medical aid, but I just want to buy the antibiotics. So I don't know what kind of antibiotics that I can uh, buy. Okay. Yes. Excellent question. Let me give it to you. He says he's got, uh, just in case you didn't hear it clearly, he's got this skin condition. We're not sure what the skin condition is. It, he thinks that, you know, it may be related to either, or it, it's in the blood, he believes. It moves from one area to the other. He would like to get some antibiotics to sort this thing out, but he doesn't know which antibiotic to buy. So I think the first thing that we would have to get to the bottom of is, is a skin infection that he's suffering from caused by a bacteria? And generally, it's very rare that your skin condition is caused by a bacteria. Mm. And typically, quite often, it is in the blood, and it is an autoimmune disease. Mm. So in other words, it's where your own immune system now is attacking your skin, right. and then we see the skin reaction. So he had most probably need to go to a doctor who can sit down and do a proper diagnosis. Right. Um, as I say, it is very, very rare. Right to have in an adult a bacterial skin infection. Yeah, okay. And, and again, it's only the doctor that will make the determination that what you have requires an antibiotic. In that sort. And, and I mean, we, we saw um, in some of the earlier tweets, uh, somebody talking about diarrhea. I mean, it goes back to the issue of, you know, the side effects with antibiotics. Your, your comment? So that is a common side effect. There, antibiotics can cause diarrhea by two mechanisms. The one is chemical, so it's where it irritates the stomach and then you get the diarrhea. But the more concerning one is your stomach is almost like a ferment fermentation vat mm. and there's good bacteria which are part of your healthy digestive system. Yeah. So what has happened there is that the good bacteria have been killed by the antibiotic mm. and something like a fungal infection or something like that has now taken over and that causes the diarrhea. And the problem from an antimicrobial resistance perspective is maybe some of the E. coli, which is the friendly bacteria, have now developed a resistance mechanism, mm. and that can now impact the whole community and not Absolutely. just that one patient. Yeah, yeah. Let's back to you. get back to you, Dr. Kerry. Now, we, we said earlier, I mean, you know, inappropriate prescription of antibiotics, uh, you know, appropriate use of antibiotics leading up to resistance. Are there any other factors outside the prescribers and the people taking medications that can cause resistance? I'm very glad you brought that up because from my background in enteric diseases, it's something that concerns me deeply. Is there are a number of mechanisms that we can be exposed to antibiotics and resistance can be developed. The first we've discussed at length is basically exposure where the patient is prescribed. The second thing that we need to look at is where the patient has been prescribed um, antibiotics for something else and I think anti this has been briefly touched on now by Gavin but, and it's for instance a patient might have been prescribed antibiotics for a sexually transmitted infection and then because that's a very short course um, treatment their other bacteria may end up developing resistance and there's very well published data on Shigella developing resistance and Shigella is an enteric bacteria but it developed resistance to an antimicrobial called azithromycin because yeah. that was introduced for sexually transmitted infections. The next thing that's very very concerning mm. is the use of antimicrobials in animal husbandry and for food animals mm. and they can be used at a number of levels. Firstly they get used for growth promotion in other words, this concept of killing off the bacteria in the gut, the good and the bad bacteria, so that the, all of the nutrients go to grow a larger animal. Okay? And this is internationally very, very strongly discouraged. Mm -hmm. The second is as prophylaxis. So if you think your herd of animals or your flock of chickens is under threat, they may then treat those animals with antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And the problem being, of course, this now gets into the food chain, so that when you go and eat your chicken, or when you go and buy your beef, if there is contamination by bacteria, and bacteria we're worried again are 
about again are your E. coli's. You also get salmonellas from chicken, you get campylobacters and resistance in these bacteria which are very very common pathogens yeah. is extremely high. So it's not only amongst the people, you know, patients and hospital setting but it's also in the farming industry as well. Very interesting. Well, Dr. Katie, thank you so much for your contribution. Dr. Katie, sector head, sorry, co-head, um, Center for Enteric Diseases, NICD. Now, I know that we have Yusuf on the line from Benoni. Yusuf, we've run out of time in this segment, but we will certainly take your call after the break. Okay, after the break, we'll discuss now antimicrobial stewardship. And yes, we're going to come back to you, uh, Dr. Steele, about progress made so far. Please stay with us. Shield Medical Scheme. We don't just talk health, we do health. South Africa remains in the grip of a dry spell. It's led to water restrictions imposed across the country. About 20,000 cubic centimeters are being released per second. Authorities say that it could take 10 days. In the meantime, they're appealing to residents to use water sparingly. Transnet says that it's increased its revenue despite the weak economic conditions affecting volumes that it handled. The company says going forward it will be investing in measures and acquisition opportunities to expand Transnet services. It says while it does not believe South Africa will be downgraded, it has however begun negotiations with lenders to prepare for any eventualities. MedShield, embracing our members in good health since 1968. Welcome back. Now, we hear there's antimicrobial stewardship. We're going to know exactly what that is. And to help us with that, we still have our guests, Dr. Gavin Steele, Chief Director, Sector-wide Procurement from the National Health uh, Department of Health. And of course, we still have uh, Angelique uh, Messina, who is the Netcare Antibiotic Stewardship Project Manager. But before that, let's take Yusuf from Benoni. Yusuf, welcome to Health Talk. Good morning. Yeah, your, your quick comment or question, please. Okay, my question is this, that uh, I would like to have the panel in another 10, 15 years' time uh, with the current uh, antibodies that are being used, will they be effective? I, I'm not sure that we got, you know, your line isn't very clear. Can you just repeat your question quickly? Okay, the question is the current antibodies that are being used, how effective will they be in another 10, 15 years' time at the rate the antibodies are being abused? Okay. You, you got the question. Yes, so it's, that's a great question. So Yusuf asked whether or not antibiotics will be still effective in the next 10 to 15 years. And the answer is, if we carry on the way we are at the moment, the answer is no. And that is a scary thing. Antibiotics must probably have been the greatest health intervention of our generation. And if we look at how the... Um, life expectancy grew after the 40s and the introduction of penicillins, mm. we are likely and we actually face a future without antibiotics mm. and a significant reduction in life expectancy of our children's generation. And mm. so that's why it's critical for us mm. to have antibiotic stewardship. Right, right. Okay, antibiotic stewardship. You said to be the project manager for antibiotic stewardship. What is antibiotic stewardship in simple terms? Okay, so um, I think if we just go back to what is the definition of a steward, mm. in its simplest term, it's really someone whose responsibility it is to take care of something. Mm. So if you're an antibiotic steward, then it's, it's your responsibility to really make sure that antibiotics are used appropriately, given at the right dose, at the right time, for the right duration, um, and for the right indications mm -hmm. as well. Mm. So really, um, any antibiotic stewardship program aims to decrease or minimize the 
inappropriate or unnecessary use of antibiotics mm. while still ensuring that those patients that are getting antibiotics are getting the appropriate ones. Mm. Talk about appropriate ones. <laughs> We're going to now talk about the hospital environment. But that, that's, where, that's where we are. But before that, let's take Musa on the line. I think this is going to be about our last caller for the day. Musa, welcome to Health Talk. Hello, good morning, sir. Yes, sir. You're, uh, you're my question is, uh, I need to find out on does uh, natural antibiotics such as herbs and honey, you know, honey for bees, affect healthy bacteria in a person? Mm. Excellent question. Again, Dr. <laughs> so, basically, if the natural antibiotic works, it's going to be indiscriminate. In other words, it's going to kill both the healthy and the um, unhealthy bacteria. Mm. And there is a product that is used for burns using honey. Um, it's called meloderm. And uh, my experience with meloderm is it'll impact the good and the bad equally. Mm. Talk about uh, good and bad bacteria and antibiotics and diarrhea and so on. There's the notion of probiotics. Okay. Can you just take us through that concept very quickly? So basically probiotics is where we have in a capsule format or a food format antibiotics that are the good digestive antibiotics. So basically, quite often a doctor will prescribe a probiotic alongside an antibiotic. And the whole idea is that by the time you, when you finish the antibiotic, you now regenerate that healthy flora inside your gut. Um, other people with other diseases such as Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel diseases will also use probiotics to make sure that they have a healthy ecosystem in their gut or gut flora okay all right i believe there's just one question on tweet on twitter that shandu says how do i know that my body is resisting antibiotics and if they're working and Elias says uh, i always prefer antibiotic because modern disease are very dangerous and harm very quickly Chico says, okay, thanks for airing antibiotic resistance during at World Health Organization Antibiotics Awareness Week. I'm a pharmacist passionate about stewardship. Well, thank you so much, Chico. <laughs> All right. Your, your comment, especially the first one, yeah? So um, the patient asking about the resistance, yeah. huh. it's not your body becoming resistant. It is a microorganism. And so I think the first thing is, if you've got a viral infection, so if I had to develop a cold, it's cold, you know, season's changing, maybe I get a late cold, and I take an antibiotic, mm. it's going to resist because the virus is not influenced by the antibiotic. Yeah. So um, basically, if you're not responding to an antibiotic, it means one of two things, that you either had an, a disease that did not need an antibiotic, right. or number two, the bacteria is not responding to that antibiotic and you need a different... A different one, because it's the wrong one. Okay, we have almost one minute okay. left. Tell us about stewardship in a hospital environment quickly. Okay, so stewardship is really important in hospital environments because we do have uh, multi-drug resistant organisms or patients in hospitals are immune compromised, requiring surgery or severely ill. Um, and so we in our hospital network have, have really used pharmacists because we don't have um, infectious disease resources in our country and um, so we've used pharmacists as a key person in the hospital to look at antibiotic prescriptions make sure that they um, at the right dose for the right duration that a, an appropriate culture has been taken prior to the antibiotic being given and um, the pharmacists have really worked within a multidisciplinary team with the prescribing doctor and the nurses and infection prevention practitioners um, to ensure that the patients in the hospitals are getting the right antibiotics so that we can limit the risk of antimicrobial resistance for those patients. Okay. Earlier it was said that 30% of prescriptions in a hospital environment is inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Is that getting better? Yes, we're working very hard to make that better. Yes. Okay. Dr. Steele, your last comment on basically what progress has been made in f insofar as the Ministerial Advisory Committee and, you know, all the stewardship uh, on the stewardship program. So I think the important thing at the moment is we now have focused and oriented dialogue amongst healthcare professionals. The important thing about the Antimicrobial Resistance Ministerial Advisory Committee is it does not only include health practitioners 
We are also bringing on board agriculture to address the issue that we heard about previously about should it be and how appropriate is the use of antibiotics in animal husbandry in order to improve production. And then we are also including veterinary colleagues for pets and animals which need antibiotics for their own rights. And so basically, we've now started the discourse. We have developed a um, antimicrobial stewardship policy for South Africa. And at the moment, our provinces are now putting together work plans and implementing those work plans so that we can get on top of this whole problem of antimicrobial stewardship, not only because we need it for the future. As you know, as a country, we looking at going into national health insurance. Yeah. And resistant bugs are much more expensive to treat than normal bugs. And also it means that you stay in a hospital longer. Mm. So it's just a very smart investment yeah. on our part as government to make sure we get on top of antimicrobial resistance. Okay. Well, let's hope that we're on the right track and we're able to arrest this huge, huge, huge problem. Dr. Gavin Stuhl, Chief Director, Sector-wide Procurement, National uh, Department of Health. Angelique Messina, uh, Netcare Antibiotics Stewardship Project Manager. Thank you so much to both of you Thank for your you. time. And yeah, we all have a part to play in preserving the effectiveness of the antibiotics that we have today. And you can help by making sure that you only use antibiotics when prescribed by a certified healthcare professional and you follow those instructions on how to take those antibiotics. And you don't demand antibiotics when told by the healthcare professional that you actually don't need them. Well, so on that note, folks, that we come to the end of our show today. Join us again next week on SABC News. And please uh, continue sharing your comments and views of us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk, and send us tweets at Twitter at SABC Health Talk. Remember that Health Talk is repeated every Saturday at 2 p.m. and Thursday at 5 a.m. I'm Dr. Sandra Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for your tweets. Thank you for your calls. And yes, thank you to my guests. Thank you. Thanks, man. All right, so time for a quick...